Hello, welcome to another episode of the Carousel Podcast. I am here with The Kino Corner, a very recognized YouTuber who makes incredible video essays about movies. Hello. Hey, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, we got in touch. I don't even really remember when, but somehow involved it was, in something. It was Urban Assembly. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. My very top patron, I think, was Mutuals with you on Twitter. And I was going to be in Miami. So he was like, oh, you need to meet my friend Isaac. Oh. Uh, well. Who that is. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you after. But yeah. <laughs> okay. He's like, you need to meet Isaac. Well, of course, I professionally go by the name Isaac. And I was like, oh, yeah. Well, then I should definitely go, go meet <laughs> Isaac. So, yeah, I think I ran into you guys in that, like, uh, classic bar in Miami. Yeah. That was yeah. Weird. We we were looking around and I remember we walked in and we're like, all right, who looks super nerdy? You know, and it's like all the kind of it's like a dive bar. So of course, like no one looks super nerdy. And then we like looked in the corner and you were with yeah. that one Australian kid and we're like, yeah. Oh yeah, it's them. <laughs> yeah, this is this Australian kid who was like a legend at Urban Assembly because he was talking about Follistatin and having just come from Prospera, and he was a very mm -hmm. funny character. Um, but why don't you follow me on Twitter? I think I do. No, you don't. You don't. Wait, I don't? No, I don't think so. I see your tweets all the time. That's why I was like, oh, yeah. I just figured I followed you. I actually you. don't follow. I did follow you, but I just always clean out my, because I have like a, I don't know. Do you do like a rule of a certain amount that you can follow? Yeah. To, yeah. For me, it's like a thousand. I recently yeah. cleaned out I and brought mine down to like 800 something yeah so i just unclick everybody who's not following me so you must have just gotten like oh that. but um you know with twitter now with twitter I thought now maybe like, i was yeah. too spicy for you or something no i follow some very spicy accounts. okay okay <laughs> I, no i just didn't know because you are obviously somebody who shows your face quite a bit and you have a massive following i mean you have like you have videos that are you have one over a million right yeah i have one it's at 1.3 yeah and then I have several that are over five hundred thousand. Um, They're great. I just hit. I just hit hundred. I'm in one hundred four thousand YouTube uh, subscribers now. I'm trying to get. I'm honestly trying to get up to at least three hundred thousand this year. So, I have an editor now, so I'll be putting out like a lot more videos. That's um, so great, dude. I, I think what you make. So you really got big in it's something you published. I think only nine months ago, which is this whole. No, literally me <laughs> yeah the the city so nobody's going to understand this so i just want to like explain it yeah. uh, you do a series of videos around what you call literally me movies mm -hmm. and literally me movies are movies like drive like taxi driver i like that you did buffalo 66 which i actually still have not seen i didn't realize that was one um yeah. these movies where guys like us are kind of like oh that character is literally me <laughs> yeah exactly like it's a joke and when I made that video, like it, it's a big joke, like on the internet, especially I think it came out of 4chan TV, which is where I first, you know, ran into this. Um, and I was like, oh, this is kind of a funny video. I want to make like a shit post video. And as I started writing it, I was, you know, I was like, okay, I'll talk about like a handful of these literally me movies or, you know, movies where people say, oh, the character is literally me. And I realized that I couldn't really find a through line with them but that all of like and that all the characters are very different you can't really compare tyler durden to patrick bateman to uh billy brown to uh uh travis bickle like they're all you know they're all very different characters um with different motivations and different moralities and you know everything like that and uh so but as I was looking into it, I realized that they pretty much all deal with the sort of uh, crisis of masculinity in the yeah. modern age yeah, uh, yeah. In, in varying forms. And there are these sort of uh, revolts, you know, it's a kind of a revolt against this uh, sissification. <laughs> the sissification of the modern the West. Male. Well, yeah. I think there's also something that you touched on in the, in the first video about them. Um, and that we'll talk about today about competing moralities mm -hmm. 
all of those characters have a morality that seems to grow more naturally from the true feelings that a man has. Mm -hmm. They're kind of executing that morality against this fake morality that is being imputed upon them. Yeah. And I think that American Psycho actually is a great example of this and that he's like both of this sort of NPC world where he is like the epitome of like the NPC. Um, but he talks, you know, in the book too, he kind of describes himself as an animal a lot in the book. And it really does feel like it's this animal urge inside him to kind of destroy everything around him. You yeah. know, this, this urge for destruction against like this uh, dead lifeless culture. And I, I was bringing up in the, um, my video on American psycho of like, he's introducing death to this culture. That's, you know, it's, um, that is eschewing death. It's jettisoning death, which I didn't want to say it in the video because I didn't want to get like too theory sellish, but it is the kind of the Baudrillard idea of revers reversibility that pavement sort of embodies. And Wait, that what idea, is that? What is the Baudrillard idea of reversibility? Reversibility. Um, basically, it's like uh, Baudrillard was talking about death sort of in the modern age. And he was talking about the 80s and, and reversibility. I mean, there's a huge it's a 400 page book that goes really, really in depth. So I can only do like a very like idiot's guide to reversibility thing here. But the way that I was using it is Baudrillard was talking about death in the modern era and how essentially as civilization, as our civilization civilization is growing we kind of get rid of death and we don't live with death like how we used to and we sort of aspire to be this kind of um uh society without death and you know he uh and we're kind of getting to that point like we talk about oh, uploading our consciousnesses right to be in some android there's these there's these uh you know shows of like oh this guy was gonna die so he got put into this simulation where you can never die this like weird sort of a version of heaven um that's not really heaven and uh but then he was basically Baudrillard's thought is that basically as you get closer to that um death will reintroduce itself and he was speaking in the 80s so obviously um influenced speaking you know by the AIDS crisis AIDS epidemic whether it's epidemic or war that it's this sort of uh I don't know it's it's, it's like uh almost like a tower of Babel sort of way of thinking, you know, you can build the tower to heaven, but at some point all the languages are going to like, everyone's going to be speaking a different language and it's all going to fall apart. Yeah. It's just man wants to be God, but there's like something there that stops. That, that. stops it. Yeah. It's actually so funny. I recorded a podcast earlier today with Lomez and Astral uh, who are people in my like corner of the mm -hmm. internet. And uh, we were saying this exact same thing. It's like rationalism led us, the, the era of enlightenment and rationalism led us to this certain point. And it's like, now we've hit this brick wall and now we're like falling all the way back down into this totally new paradigm. And I think that that's, you're saying the exact same thing. You're like, we've reached the end of of our ability to cheat death you know, we've like a re uh, we've like used science and human advancement to the absolute limit that we can. And now it's like crumbling. <laughs> We're but headed this, the other way. Yeah. And this morality that um, has gotten us to this point is now sort of eating. It's almost yeah. like eating itself and uh, yeah. leading us down these like really like if we use the morality that we had it leads us down into you know Weimar 2.0 yeah, well right well I mean then that's kind of where we were and I mean I think like uh you know this uh, like uh, medically assisted death is kind of the perfect mm -hmm. example well, of your type and that's that's what you're saying it's like Bateman is returning to this old morality of animalistic behavior in a way yeah it's it's, it's yeah. like a he's shocking in the context of 1980s Manhattan uh, he would his character wouldn't necessarily be shocking in the context of uh, a Bronze Age, right. you know, a pirate yeah. or a tribal member. Like, 
you'd say, oh, okay, yeah, maybe he's one of the C people and wouldn't be shocking at all. Like, right. Raid um, societies, raiding societies. I mean, yeah, most of the world was raiding societies for most mm -hmm. of the time. And it's not like that instinct just gets turned, you know, flipped off, even though we pretend that it does. Like we yeah. pretend that we're not bloodthirsty, you know, people, but we are, or some of us are. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I don't want to get too deep into this. I really would love to, at some other point, just learn all about how you decided to do what you did. Um, you know, how you make such incredible videos that they're really very well made is what oh, I, thanks. I would say on top of anything. They're, they're extremely professional. They must take you so long. Mm. yeah you know but i'm fa i'm fast you're good I'm, now. Fa I'm fast at it now and yeah. coke zero and coffee <laughs> helped me edit for 18 hours at a time yeah so. my father-in-law <laughs> my father-in-law is a film editor was a film editor he edited mall rats oh, okay <laughs> i um my very first movie that i made i made on a budget of 75k and that starred uh one of the stars of it was Jeremy London, who was T.S. in Mall Rats, oh. the main character. Wait, yeah. so are you a filmmaker mm -hmm. yourself? You are. OK. Yeah. Yeah. I, not... I, I came from the world of working on sets, um, working on sets, being a script doctor, kind of doing the whole Hollywood stuff. Uh, I only started taking YouTube seriously once COVID started because um, all the jobs were gone. But yeah, I was like I was also a narrative editor. Um, the music videos and all you know a whole bunch of stuff and but yeah that's why i guess i i started doing film youtube just because i i you know during when covid started to hit i was i was passing time i was watching some of these like channels i'm like these kids don't know what they're talking about i, I could yeah. do it better so well, I think you found your purpose in life, man. There is, I mean, I am not a YouTuber at all. I'm, I'm just not really like YouTube is not my thing, but mm -hmm. I do occasionally watch Chris Stuckman review videos. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you have <laughs> thoughts on him. <laughs> no. Okay. My, my thoughts on Chris Stuckman. Uh, I don't, so I don't watch any, uh, ever, ever since I started making videos, I don't watch any um, film related videos at all on YouTube. I stick only like primary sources and, and you know, that's, interviews. That, that makes yeah. me really happy to hear because sometimes I get really guilty and feel like my life is ridiculous when I don't read, I don't read any other sub stacks. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I don't have time for this shit, but then I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, if I don't do it, then why are people reading mine? You know? Yeah. No, no, yeah. I, I know that feeling, <laughs> but I just don't want to be influenced by anybody. Oh wait, you're drinking a, Oh, here we go. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers to the Pellegrino. Pellegrino nationalism. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I just don't watch any any of the film, film YouTube stuff. Uh, partially one, because I don't care what any of them have to say. And two, if I do care about what they have to say, then I don't want to be influenced, but I, I still want to be unique in my voice. And I would think like, oh, no, I'm watching this. Oh, no, they do this. I like how they do this. And I don't do that. But then if I start to put that into my videos then it comes off like I'm aping off of somebody else. So I just say like, mm -mm, no, I'll just watch my documentaries on Bronze Age societies and Roman history <laughs> um, Use that in. In, in lectures and lectures about philosophy. And that's pretty much the only things I watch on YouTube. Um, yeah. But uh, what was I? I completely lost my train of thought. It's all right. um, uh yeah no let's we were just talking about your business model and everything and but but let's not get into that because I I will just get so curious and down the rabbit hole that we'll never get out of it so let's let's talk about what we're here to talk about which is I want to discuss with you this trend that I'm seeing that I just wrote an article about yesterday it's called the rise of the populist genre film and what I'm seeing is this rise of films that are kind of loosely based on most dangerous game, which is this death battle amongst people at the behest of sort of a rich elite. There's been a million versions of this squid mm -hmm. game, hunger games, battle Royale. Um, these are all versions of like rich people. The Coliseum. Kind of yeah. <laughs> it's right. all versions of Yeah. Right. The it's like the yeah. new Coliseum. I should have said mm -hmm. that in this piece, but, um, but the new Coliseum, instead of being in a Coliseum, they're watching behind like, uh, two-way glass 
I think the, the mm-hmm. way they're doing the Squid Game is so beautiful. I love the 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 elites and that with their weird masks and their their strange like way they act and they're mm-hmm. hitting on the you know male uh, people. And we also had the Hunt, which was actually literally a right wing movie. I think that was about yeah. elites killing Republicans. Yeah, I remember. I remember that the movie got delayed because there was a huge outcry. Oh, right. Yeah, that yeah. this movie was. Oh my God. This is movie is about liberals hunting down Republicans and the liberals are the good guys. And this is they're really showing their colors this time. And then when you watch the movie, the hero is a Republican and the liberals are not only the evil ones, but they're literally just idiots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Glenn Howerton was, <laughs> was, you know, great. And they don't know what they're doing. And. Yeah, and it's all because people uh, people were making up conspiracy theories about them online. Yeah, which is yeah, right, right. So so um, those movies have been around for a while. Although I do definitely think that they're <laughs> growing in popularity. There there seems to be more and more of these types of movies being made. And mm-hmm. actually, since the original Most Dangerous Game, there hasn't been that many of them. The, these kind of death game things, at least that I could find. Now, I mean, we also have The Purge. Yeah. Now, this year, we had three movies come out that not only have basically poor people trying to kill each other, which is how these things have always been done before. Now, they have rich people who are also trying to kill each other. So it's like, instead of it being mm-hmm. the rich, we have this allegory of the rich putting the poor through a rigged game in which they die. Now we've gone like one step further to where we're literally fantasizing about putting the rich in the game and killing the rich. So it's like even more an eat the rich type of. Yeah. Movie. So those movies are Glass Onion, which is the follow up to um, Knives Out. Knives Out. <laughs> the Menu, which is a kind of silly art film. And then Triangle of Sadness, which is, I think, the third big movie of this guy, Ruben Ostland, who previously did. Um, the square, the square, and force majeure, and, and force majeure, right? He 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 had a few. He had several movies before that, but I think force majeure is really what put him on the map internationally. Right, right. and and they remade it with Will Ferrell, and he's a <laughs> you know great uh, Swedish satirist. So mm-hmm. I guess what I want to see is ask you just really just to kick off the conversation. Do you think there is even a rise in this type of like i call them populist movies because populist genre films because populism basically means like hatred of the rich kind of or hatred of the elites yeah i mean i i think that it just there is a rise and i think that the rise has to do with current um political and and economic conditions you know uh going into going into a recession, the rise of populism in 2015 and 2016 that still exists today and how uh, populism, not just on the right, but populism on the left, you know, we like the right did have Trump, but the left also had Bernie Sanders. And so what's really happening is now that there's essentially four or three major contingencies in the states, and that is the neoliberal, neoconservative, kind of the old guard, um, populist left and populist right and the fact is is that there's quite a few people on the populist left who make movies i would say more so on the populist left than populist right it's you know the movie industry at least since i would say maybe the 70s has skewed towards the left usually center left um uh but you know i think that there is this rise of the populist left eat the rich um ideals uh and, you know, we're starting to see that more in movies that play to American audiences. But to say that I don't think it's anything new, but I think it's it's interesting um, in terms of American film, because if we go to other nations, if we go to Europe, like Bunuel was making these kinds of movies in the 60s, like The Exterminating Angel, uh, Godard was making these films. A lot of the French New Wave films were definitely sort of taken on a bit more of a... a populist left sort of attitude but since those movies were um you know you could even say sallow sort of uh fits fits into this as well but since those were which but the thing is is that it's hard to it's hard to call them 
populist uh, for when they released. Like, I think if those movies came out now, like if the exterminating angel came out now, we'd be talking about this here. But the thing is, is that that anti-bourgeois attitude wasn't exactly the populist sentiment back in the 60s. It was a more like academic left yes. sentiment. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, now it's just that this is the populist, this kind of ether-rich attitude, this anti-bourgeois attitude is populist. And, and it is something that people on both the right and the left, you know, if they're not like a fan of, you know, the establishment can sort of agree on is that, you know, we don't like journalists yeah. <laughs> or, or the, like these super rich people. Um, and, you know, when I think about, when I think about populism, you know, we're thinking about, we're talking about the menu and triangle of sadness and what's a better, you know, what's a better metaphor for the common man than the cheeseburger, <laughs> the in and out cheeseburger. And <laughs> I guess this is going to get us right into the movies because both triangle of sadness and the menu use the cheeseburger as like their populist metaphor it's such a great call and you said said this to me earlier and i was like oh my god that's so true and and just to throw people in i don't know if it's an in and out burger though is it an in and out burger or is an in and out is it an no. burger the elitist of the of, of, the, of the burger in and out's not elite it's like five bucks no i know it's cheap and it's amazing yeah. how they've kept it together but uh you're eating it's for the the listeners who aren't watching it he's eating an in and out burger but what he's referring to is in the menu um i mean we can set this up and you can walk us through but there's a moment in which she asks the chef the crazed chef gone wrong to make her a cheeseburger and that's supposed to stand for something i'll let you set that up but uh, and then in Triangle of Sadness, Woody Harrelson, who plays kind of the communist voice, or the the Marxist voice, everyone else is eating this these ridiculous meals, and he orders a cheeseburger. And it's remarkable how similar these two scenes are. It's like mm -hmm. it's almost they're so like identical, and it's kind of incredible that they were created randomly in the same year, like totally separately. Yeah, I mean, like. Think about it like this. We had three of these populist eat the rich movies, two of which had major cheeseburger scenes. But what's even weirder is how, why did we have like three or four Pinocchio movies this year? Yeah. <laughs> Something was in the water where everyone was just making the same, like all yeah. the same shit. It, it was, um, it was anti Semitism. That's, the, <laughs> that's, but, that's why Pinocchio is because your nose but, grows longer than <laughs> So, so with the, um, cheeseburger in the menu this is kind of how i saw the cheeseburger in the menu and it is kind of cutting to maybe the heart of the menu pretty pretty quickly um but it's that he's a chef right and she finds out that he start he's a chef that's like a um like a chef that david gelb would feature on chef's table you know and uh uh making these like uh pe like a, like everything that he does is like an art piece and and uh, none of the none of the food is really made to like fill you up. You know, it's not made to be like food. It's made to be like, oh, you're at an art gallery and you're getting, you know, you're getting this experience. And that's really what it's about. And she sees that he started off as a burger chef, <laughs> came from a working class family. And uh, he the only time that she saw him smile was in that uh, photo where he's cooking the, you know, making cheeseburgers uh, in the back of some McDonald's or something. So she asks him to make him, uh, to make her a cheeseburger. And he does. And she like barely eats it, wants to get a to go box. Uh, and I mean, I saw this as like, I don't know, like the, the thing about the menu is I felt like a lot of its metaphors were a bit muddled and confused um but the cheeseburger is obviously supposed to be like i want the real food the food that makes you happy not the food that you're making to appease critics or appease this kind of uh managerial class that prides themselves on eating at your establishment make me something that tastes good and something that you like and something that i like and something that actually fills me up 
and maybe has a more utilitarian goal than what he's making for everybody else. And she's like, this is a really good cheeseburger, you know, and she's, and, you know, it's this first thing that she's eaten and really enjoyed that night. And it's, and it is kind of like, uh, as I said, it's, I mean, he put it, he put just as much care and craft into that cheeseburger as he put into the other foods, but this is something that is, uh, maybe less pretentious, I guess. Um, but the thing about the movie is, and then the movie sort of says like the cheeseburger is really the ideal where it's, it is the, it is populism essentially as yeah. a cheeseburger, it's but the, most the populist food, right? Yeah, exactly. It's populist. It still takes a great effort. It still takes great care and it can still be great, but this is something for everybody instead of for the elite. Yeah. The problem with the menu that I, I found is that the menu was one of his other dishes that wanted to be the cheeseburger and it didn't go like it should have turned into a full-on exploitation gore you know how like it like if if the movie wanted to be the cheeseburger it should have had way more gore it should have had like over the top you know kind of schlock it should have had um you know sex in it like it should have had these things instead it's still relegated itself to um trying to be kind of like i wouldn't even say like an art house but like more like a prestige film god it was so confused i mean i think that's a hilarious and amazing metaphor that it, it wants to be the cheeseburger but it can't be because it's created by committee is what mm -hmm. i think i mean it's like what what it seems so clear to me in that movie is that it had writer's room syndrome it was like the sh nothing the chef did it was like they kept saying to themselves okay wait is the chef a good guy no we need to write a scene that shows the chef is actually crazy because he's not a good guy he's the bad guy but then they were like trying to go back and make him likable and justified and they couldn't decide and there was like too many people weighing in and he was this character that was kind of pieced together like it, mm -hmm. i got the overwhelming sense that this had been like really redlined by a bunch of fucking development executives who said yeah. like oh we can't say that oh here we need to shoehorn this scene in where there's a feminist statement for no reason that comes out of nowhere where she stabs it, it. it's like what it where did that doesn't come from? yeah it doesn't affect the rest of the movie and it doesn't yeah. do anything for the film yeah how the menu felt to me is like it was once a great script yeah i agree it's like, it got seemed like it down. started as great and then yeah yeah, yeah. like they got watered down and now we have like this it's then it's confused because there's there's aspects of it that i really like like i really like nicholas holt's character that the guy that knows everything about how these how it's yeah. all made but he can't do anything himself i mean like i was a filmmaker and you were talking to critics or what like when you're talking to people who watch a lot of movies and they'll be like yeah yeah this was shot on this this camera and blah 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 and and then i i'm like okay do you know how to like shoot on film Oh yeah, well you do this and this. I'm like, actually, you're completely wrong. Like you don't do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. that funny story. That's actually one of the. There's a video about called like uh, about how great 16 millimeter film was, and as a filmmaker, I shoot on 16 millimeter, and I remember watching the video and I was like, I can so tell that this guy's never shot on 16 millimeter. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> like you're getting all like you're getting so much of this wrong. Yeah. Like it seems right. And like, if you, if, if you don't, you know, it's like the knowledge doesn't um, knowledge isn't practicality. So it's like, you might read this and you might do the research, but if you haven't done it, there's, there, there's, uh, there's a gulf, you know? Um, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's different when you actually do something rather than when you just read about it, but you know, and then the critics who, um, <laughs> gave him bad reviews yet still suck up to him and still um you know uh love to 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 brag about how he invited like they, they yeah. still they still basically want to get like the clout the the vc guys you know who are just there because it's high status thing and they don't really even care about any of the food uh the rich people who just go there to eat and like they don't appreciate anything that he does like it's like if you're an artist you have you know, there's 
like those are all kind of classes of people yeah. that you do despise. They're like archetypes. They're like they're like yeah. patron archetypes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I never I didn't think about it that way. I think it was all so muddied. I didn't like I didn't. Yeah, it was also tell me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it actually very poorly shot and and set up like the the set was ugly. It didn't mm-hmm. look very good. Like I remember the remember the scene where the person gets killed in the water. Yeah, that looked in- terrible. That looked like a really crappy like. I don't you know, know what you would say. It just would I'm gonna show my way. elitism. I'm gonna show my elitism here. Okay. <laughs> I think that one of the problems is that it has a very digital look to it because they're trying to they're trying to ape the look of Chef's Table, the Netflix oh. show. Which hmm. the show, I really like the show Chef's Table. It works as a documentary, you know, a great documentary show. Um but it doesn't translate as well when you're doing a satire. I, I I didn't think, and yeah, like they just had like this dark. Uh, the the set just wasn't visually interesting. It was like a dark room, yeah, with a, with a kitchen I, that doesn't really build out the world <coughs> that yeah. they're in. Like w- when you're basically all in one set, you would want the set to have some sort of life in itself, you know. And yeah, and it just it just kind of looked flat. Like it looked like they were going for naturalism, like how maybe a restaurant would look, but with how over the top the film gets, they should have um the, the they sh- you know, and how it's not really shot in a very naturalistic way, anyways. It's not shot like it's a documentary. They should have, I don't know, they should have played around more with it. And yeah, the the whole like drowning the um head of the bc or his yeah. like pa- his head patron it didn't really play as intense at all like it probably should have yeah and it did kind of come out of you know it did kind of come out of like nowhere as well yeah um i it, think yeah like it wasn't set up or anything right i think you you have it exactly right though that the, the issue with that movie is it's a uh, it's like it <laughs> It is exactly, and I, we're going to say the same thing about Glass Onion. It is exactly the thing that it is trying to criticize. Like it is saying we want the cheeseburger, but it is unable to make the cheeseburger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like it, it likes the idea of the cheeseburger, or somewhere along the way it was a cheeseburger, but then, you know, it, it is killed by the very thing that it's mocking. In a yeah. way, you know, and I, I want to point out, I want to yeah. point out that like the you know the the movies that are the cheeseburger made by the you know three star Michelin chef are is the trilogy of life by Pier Paolo Pasolini, uh, because before that he was making all these you know uh, adaptations of myth like Medea, uh, Oedipus Rex, um, you know he had like neo realism like Akatone and Mama Roma. And then he he said that he realized that he was making all these movies that were essentially for the elite, right? There, he's like, it's it's the kind of upper crust of society that likes my movies, and in these movies, I have this, you know, I'm trying to get across like his version, I would say, his version of Marxist ideology, his kind of populist ideology, and he said that he realized that he's trying to get these ideas across and these movies that are only going to be watched by, <laughs> you know, the people that he's probably criticizing. Like, yeah, yeah. and so he made the trilogy of life, which are just like pure sex comedies, you yeah. know, yeah. and they were huge hits. Uh, so <laughs> he, he did. Yeah. He turned the right corner. That's, that's interesting. I, I regrettably, I have never seen a Pasolini film. I'm of course aware of Solo, but um, I, yeah, my dad's a huge Pasolini guy and he's always trying to get me to watch Pasolini films. And I, I love his films. I never, <laughs> I'm, I'm well, like I'll, one of his biggest I'll, fans. <laughs> I'll get around to it. But um, no, I think, uh, I mean, that's what's so interesting about, as you put it earlier, also, it's like um, Marxist leftism, populist leftism um, is always in these elite institutions. I have never met more Marxist than in the world of advertising. Mm-hmm. There are so many hardcore leftists that are writing stuff like, 
like, uh, you know, I was doing some research for this and there's like all these like hardcore left wing newspaper, like publications out there that just write openly like, yeah, we need to burn the, down the like the houses of the rich. Like, you know, that's what we need to do. And they the leftists hated Glass Onion and the menu also because for these exact reasons that we're saying. But right. it's funny because I'm glad the Pasolini realized that because it's like there is some weird combination of like the cool kids in the elite world are all marxists for some reason yeah. they are all like let's kill the rich marxists but they're not right wing you know this is a big mold bug point it's like it's like the actual no-no is being right wing and if you step into that world you're totally gone but yeah. if you're in the left world you can burn people you can kill people you can murder people <laughs> you know and it's kind of cool you know it's like oh you know it's like bill yeah, Ayers, go exactly. get a university position like because you have a you know chase a budin it's like oh that's cool like you are a badass you know whereas if you step even slightly into the world of the right, you know, you belong in Florence Supermax and like nobody ever sees you again. I mean, just look at how there's, you know, how, how much hate like Anna and Dasha have brought on themselves for go from going from kind of the populist left to kind of right of center. Yeah. yeah. You know, and even just having people like Fisted by Foucault and BAP or whatever and Alex Jones on their show, like, but I mean, I, I'm seeing like in the Dime Square scene and a few more scenes like net like it's becoming there is a pushback against that. But yeah, I've I've always kind of found that funny and that a lot of the most avowed the most avowed Marxists I know, yeah, are all like trust fund kids. All of them. No, I mean without yeah. exception. I don't know a single working class person who is an avowed Marxist. I mean, I knew one. I worked at the Ace Hotel as a bartender for a while and there was one guy there who was like a oh, dishwasher who was a Marxist and he like carried around a book, like, like a little book. Where he's and I was like, Oh, you're like a legitimate, like, well, you're like yeah. the old school guy. Like he, you're exactly what he had in mind, but that's the only one of those. I've ever and, it, and it's, it's always been like that. I want, I want to point yeah. out, like, it's always been like that um, to go back to Pasolini. Uh, there were student protests and riots in Rome in 68, just, just like how in, you know, in, in France, there were student riots and the students were fighting the cops. Of course, the uh, Italian Marxist party, Italian communist party was saying like, oh, we stand with the students, you know, we stand with the students for, uh, you know, uh, you know, because they're communists. And then, <laughs> and even though Pasolini himself identified as Marxist, he goes, no, I stand with the cops. And, <laughs> and, it pissed off so many people and he explained he goes these students are all it's all the bourgeois this is the, the, their idle class and they're doing this because they don't have to work they're doing this because yeah. they are financially able to they're socially allowed to do this yeah and they're they're the bourgeois that you guys rail against whereas the cops are the proletariat and they are just doing their job yeah. And they have to feed their wives and kids and go into these riots. They might die and then their family will be destitute, but they do their job anyways. And it's like, and these kids are just being spoiled brats. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm like, yeah, from a Marxist perspective, if you were like, you know, if you actually <laughs> were uh, ideologically pure, you wouldn't side with the students because you would realize that they're all rich kids who are just destroying stuff because they can. Yeah, because yeah. they're angry about yeah. about something, you know. Yeah, about <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who knows a lot? Um, cool. All right. Well, so uh, your review of uh, the menu, I'm gathering, is is not a great one. Your overall, you know, my overall thing. I was so I was I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. I was just really nonplussed by it. Like <laughs> as I said, as I said, there's uh, in the script there's. I can see where <laughs> it once was probably something really good. Yeah. You know, and it just felt like something that could be really good that got watered down uh, quite a lot. And uh, still there are moments, there are moments that I liked, like the whole Nicholas Holt uh, killing himself was funny. Like yeah. having to make the, the dish and then realizing that he knows nothing like, okay that's good but yeah it it just it really 
fuddled it's it's metaphor like it really fumbled a lot of the ideological themes and and i also just uh i'm not really a huge foodie so like yeah. the whole like oh look at this food and they're eating, i'm like I, it's just something i don't care about as much <laughs> yeah yeah so. you weren't you weren't like uh interested in that well that's kind of the point that justin murphy is making in his caviar cope thing so mm -hmm. justin murphy is saying that these movies are we are like indulging in the lifestyles of the rich and we get to see it and it's like oh it, we like it but then we get to also indulge in the fact that you know the people who can afford it are being are terrible and being killed or or he also yeah. compared it to white lotus where yeah they're they're terrible and their like lives are destroyed and it's succession also yeah i Which also I don't like, totally agree with, but i i think uh yeah i mean i also think that with some of these movies they tend to want to want to portray all the elites as being terrible but <laughs> you know i'm i know a lot of r really rich people yeah. and most of them are pretty good people yeah no totally. um actually most of the people who i know who are like actually you know actual criminals or actual like i don't trust or are not the are not the rich people it's people who are typically poor um yeah yeah you know no that's for all sure. i can like there's a yeah. level of trust <laughs> like you know I, there, there's a reason why among rich people there's a higher level of trust than poor people around other poor people yeah no definitely. you know so i also just i i, I think I, I can watch the movies and see what they're saying about a particular kind of bourgeois but i i'm also like this is like with the menu and with glass onion we'll get to glass onion next because man that is probably one of the worst movies of last year um <laughs> yeah it is like it it is like this this sort of almost wet dream of what the rich are like like i don't like yeah. the wealthy because of the wef or something like that right i don't like the wealthy because they need to pay their taxes or uh you know something like that so i'm just gonna imagine them all as being these absolutely terrible people yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but the thing that gets me about these like populist movies and this is <laughs> this is a it, it's they're all the con like the thing is they're all contradictions um because the most bourgeois art, like the most bourgeois form of art is movie making. Like you can paint something for very little money. Now I know paint is expensive and canvases can be expensive, but like a painting, you know, like can cost you 50 bucks or a hundred dollars or whatever to, to, to paint. I don't know, maybe, maybe more, but you can write a book for free. You can self publish online, you know? Um, you just need uh, like a basic computer and word processing and the word processing stuff is like, is free now. So um, if you can, you know, afford a $300 laptop, Hey, you know, you have, you have what you need to, to write a book. Um, you can like so many people can, you know, homeless people make music. Like you don't need a lot to make a lot of forms of art. You need millions of dollars to make a movie. Yeah. And so you're not going to be getting like Joe Schmo to fund your movie for you. You're going to be getting uh, the elite, the people who have like $10 million to give to you or $20 million to give to you. I don't know what the budget for Glass Onion was, but the budget had to be, I mean, I'm guessing it was over 20 million yeah. based on, based yeah, on the like set, based on the cast. Um, you know, the cast. Yeah. Just and everything that they had going for it. I'm like, it looked like a 20 to $30 million movie, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was over that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so <laughs> like in, in, and so 30 million, a uh, 30 million. That's yeah. Says, who knows, but yeah. That makes, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. And, but, and so then it always, I always find it funny then when these movies that are <laughs> made for, 30 million dollars are like yeah aren't the rich terrible and like <laughs> only the like everyone who's making this movie is rich yeah you know yeah. and it feels like they're I, it, in a way it kind of feels like the 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 bourgeois class is trying to 
appease the masses with yeah, this which like which is the God. grossest thing right it's yeah like, it, it, which is what, like, yeah here take this thing so you don't actually come kill us like yeah you, you can get you your pretend. yeah you can pretend like you're you know we're gonna i mean it's the bread and circuses sort of thing right but yeah. it's kind of like if you sent your gladiators out dressed as dressed in togas rather than dressed in like normal gladiator stuff but it's... but but that really brings us to why this particular elite is so distasteful particularly like to people like me i i think that like you're totally right look there's always going to be an elite they're always going to be hated by the masses they're always going to be held up to ridiculous scrutiny that's really not fair and you know but just simply because they're in these positions of power that's never going to not be the case mm -hmm. The issue is that this particular elite feels so rotten and and like so terrible, and and I think that uh, and what Oslin does, what what I said, and incorrect, <laughs> like well, yeah, it's it's like Ryan Johnson. He knows the people who are like Ryan Johnson is one of the elite. Like yeah, he he might want to parade around like ah uh, like I'm the working. Like I'm a regular guy. It's like, no, you're not, dude. You yeah. are you are in the one percent of the one percent. Well, and he's the the so I have met a few people like this in my time in LA. He's actually absolute peakily because he's like a guy who wasn't elite, then was in like brought into the elite about 20 years ago mm -hmm. and has just been in that world for 20 years, like just enjoying it. So it's like his life is so totally foreign from the normal person. Like, like he yeah. has nothing in common with, like he has so much less in common than, than somebody like me. I don't, I don't know about you, but like somebody like me than the son of Ryan Johnson, because, you know, the son of Ryan Johnson has been in it for a while. He's like, you know, Hunter Biden, like he takes it for granted. Whereas mm -hmm. Ryan Johnson's still like enchanted by the magic, yeah, you know, like yeah. the magic of his life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. Um, and I do get that sense. Like, if we look at the the cast of of Glass Onion, it is, it's it's essentially trying to ape the very first movie, which is Minority Woman needs to get revenge on uh, an elite group of white people, mostly white people, I would say. This kind of who Ryan Johnson sees as the established uh, sort of ruling class of america now with knives out he went after the sort of uh waspy yeah. um right. waspy right. like living in a mansion and where was it like new jersey or something so like a northeast or upstate new york like a, a like a northeast uh new england -y. i don't i don't know if it was in new england or not but yeah. um yeah. kind of waspy like oh this like these are the the east coast sort of people and so now with glass onion he's going after people silicon valley like a, a west coast the west coast elite yeah yeah um and he has uh ed norton who ed norton's character is sort of modeled after i mean it's it's most definitely elon musk 90 yeah. percent elon musk yeah, a little bit of the um woman from theranos and a little bit from other places but you get a sense that it's Elon Musk. And the problem I really have with Glass Onion is that it is a political satire first, a bad political satire at first. First, mystery second. So the second that you go, so the second that they get to the to the island and you see that Ed Norton is the character that is being satirized, you go, oh, he's a bad guy. Like, you know it because he is the subject of scrutiny of this movie. And it's like, oh, okay. The movie's like, okay, movie's over. Like he's right. Okay. It's like you, I, I don't know yeah, what he right. did. Yeah, exactly. You know that there is no way that he's not gonna be the problem. It's so yeah. obvious. No, that's a really great way to put that. Yeah, and I mean, and that's not to say that like the other characters aren't good. Like they're all incredibly. And this was the first. That was a problem I had with the first Knives Out. All the characters are incredibly two dimensional, and it really comes off not just as a guy that. Um, you know, has lived with the elite and obviously doesn't understand what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. You know, he doesn't really, he doesn't really get that. I mean, I currently, uh, you know, living in a city, I currently basically live paycheck to paycheck until, you know, my YouTube gets better, but um, you know, it's like, 
So I'm watching this and I'm like, this guy is like not based in reality, but it's also like a guy that's been in the elite for the last couple of decades. Yeah. Who also spends way too much time on fucking Twitter. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, exactly. like that's, yeah, totally. that's the thing. Like the yeah. thing is, is that when it, I, I would, you know who, you know, who satirizes the elite a lot better than Ryan Johnson is Brady Stanellis, yeah. you know? The yeah. rules of attraction, that is like the elite kids. Yeah. That is totally. that is them. Like well, uh, less know, than zero is is the high school version of that. And yeah, less they, than zero know, is like the yeah. high school yeah, yeah. version. Um or or I think he's it's like his first year of college. It's his first or, year back, but he's visiting high school. So it's like yeah. it's that world. It's the LA rich high school kids world. Yeah. And then rules and then the rules of attraction is uh college. The, the college, yeah, the yeah. New England, the yeah. New England College. Well, because he went to Bennington, right? With yeah, he went to Bennington, and I almost, I almost got caught up in that whole scene because I got into <laughs> middle. I almost went to Middlebury. Yeah, that would I think Middlebury is the... way more like normy though than Bennington. Bennington's like weird, but like yeah. Benning, it goes like Bennington is in the world of um, Bard and Sarah Lawrence where my wife went and you know like yeah. read the college up read, in yeah. Oregon, my, you know, my cousin like went that. to bard yeah <laughs> that's yeah. like that little network those are like the really weird rich kids you know and then it's yeah. like second levels like skidmore and whatever that thing you were just saying uh, yeah like middlebury Mid yeah. middlebury williams yeah, yeah. Uh, well you're right right yeah 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 um yeah my cousin went to bard i don't think like I don't think she did any work no. <laughs> for years because she studied photography. And I remember we gave her like we we're it was a Thanksgiving, right? And we gave her a camera that's like a normal like SLR camera. I mean, this is pre DSLR days, so this was like 12, 13 years ago or something. And she like didn't know how to work it or how to frame the shot and she's like i don't know what to do and we're like you're a you just graduated with a photography major it's like what have you been you know? doing for the past four but years? it's just like it, it, yeah exactly but it's just like in the rules of attraction where it's like yeah. everyone is just like changing majors willy-nilly like yeah. they're not but they're not going to classes you know <laughs> like yeah, yeah. I mean, and they're doing a lot of they're just kind of getting high all the time and yeah and they're not like bad people necessarily but they're just like they they've never had to work for anything so they just sort of don't do any like well, they're bad people in the sense that they're narcissists i think so well, i yeah. went to uh visit my wife before we long before we were married when she was still going to sarah lawrence and i was like 27 mm -hmm. <laughs> and i was this like 27 year old bro who just showed up at sarah lawrence and like stayed in her dorm and I remember we were hanging out with her friend. I had just arrived on campus and like we hadn't even gone to her dorm yet. And her friend was like, oh, uh, come take a look at my studio. And we like come and take a look at her studio. This is like I'd been there for 10 minutes. We walk in and she's like, here it is. And there's a giant picture or there's like a whole photo spread on the wall of her just naked. Like, you know, legs spread, like in all kinds of different things. And I'm just like, I just met you 10 minutes ago. And now I'm like <laughs> yeah. staring into your vagina. Like, this. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it's like, sorry. Yeah. I... <laughs> um, which is very serious. But anyway, okay. So back to Glass Onion. What, what, um, yeah, keep walking us through what was happening with this movie. I think that was a great point you made about it. It's like, it, there's no tension at all because you know it's like they set it up as like this is the bad guy and then he never isn't the bad guy he's the bad yeah. guy the entire time yeah yeah exactly and <sighs> um and so they kind of try to do this the glass onion sort of also operates as like two movies there's a one movie where ryan trons is intentionally actually they, people on film on twitter have been like it's called misdirection it's not misdirection if it's two different shots where say you see daniel craig uh spying in on you know uh dave bautista's wife like having sex with ed norton oh but then in the second half you see that he's actually with the um janelle uh monet but it's like no like that's actually just like deception that's not like that's not necessarily misdirection like they're with each other but we only we see like a like an edited version a skewed version of it yeah that's cheating it's cheating yeah. right that's not misdirection it would be misdirection if it was her but there was some 
other explanation, right? Or like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so I remember, like, so the first half, you know, Daniel Craig is acting like this bumbling idiot. And then um, the at the point where uh, Janelle Monae gets shot, and you think that she dies, it's like, okay, let's actually start from the beginning. And now we can see that this Elon Musk guy is only um, is only wealthy is only like, because, because uh, he um, uh he's only wealthy be, like because he stole all these ideas from Janelle Monet or like she plays as like these identical twin sisters um and then when she didn't want to give him what he wanted he went and killed her and so now it's actually the twin sister who's there posing as her yeah, yeah. of course this brings a lot of questions where just of you know how does this necessarily uh, makes sense. Uh, he probably knew that something was up. Why did he say, okay, yeah, come, come over to this boat. Oh, and this detective who's with you, this famous detective who's with you. Why didn't he just say, you're not invited? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, obviously he knows what happened. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I'm pretty sure everyone else knew what happened too. Why wasn't there just like a, yeah, you're not invited. We're we're hanging out together. Yeah. You know, but I guess the movie had to happen right. for this to happen. But also my question, my question about his character, you know, is trying to to basically it boils down to wow, Elon Musk is really dumb, guys, isn't he? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. That's there's a whole monologue about how, oh, he's actually really dumb. And that's that's yeah. clearly Ryan Johnson's perspective on Elon Musk, is he's actually an idiot. But my question, but my question is this, if he was really dumb, then why did she keep him around for so long? Yeah. Why did she make him the CEO? Like, if he was so dumb, then why, why didn't she just let, let him go? Like when he maybe outlived whatever usefulness he had. And it seems like he never had any usefulness. Yeah. yeah. You know, so why did that? And, you know, that's my question. Like, okay, so, so why is he even in this position then? Yeah, I think overall it just all speaks to the the fragile the, the fragile nature of of this elite mindset that is it's like all balanced on these things that don't make any sense. I also thought Janelle Monet was terrible. She's like so much worse an actress than everybody she's, else that no, was she, there. She's and it was, awful. It's like she's her awful. face doesn't move. And this is like this is the whole thing. It's like I am not at all a racist when it comes to and like you know i'm not even like a racial realist when it comes to acting there is absolutely black people are in every way as good at acting as white people there's no like i mean you have i don't think like an actor white people are like better at acting i've never seen that there's no i would say i would say that if you i would say if you were to ask like the normal like a normal (laughs) person like who they thought like to name some of their favorite actors working a day, Denzel Washington would yeah, probably be one of the first. Dude, Denzel yeah. right now is absolutely on fire. Like I love mm-hmm. this like fat, drunk old Denzel. It's so good. Like in Mac Macbeth was in one of my favorite movies of last year. Macbeth was like, oh yeah, good. that was a great. Yeah, that yeah. was a great. And one. Denzel was just having a blast, like just killing. And and nobody, I mean, Denzel is as good as anybody as far as I'm concerned. Like he, what he does, especially now, he's really like hit a new gear. And like, he's just absolutely killing it. So it's like, there are plenty of great black actors out there. And yet you, you have to cast this like totally wooden, terrible, like woman who can't even like move her face more than like Mm -hmm. one inch. Cause she's like really pretty. Like it just was so, this is like the problem. It's like, they're trying to be like racially tolerant, but really they just make it worse. Yeah. I mean, there's other, like, there's, plenty of other better actors it could have chosen from yeah. too and maybe it was the name factor of like janelle monet like it was this yeah. pop star and it's going to be this it's going to be cool because i'm having a pop star like in this leading role and yeah, yeah. you know it's going to be like when people cast david bowie in a movie but the thing is is that david bowie was a great actor yeah like, he was <laughs> right, awesome right, right. <laughs> you know yeah. um yeah. mick yeah. jagger people was, are just good and some of them yeah are. yeah yeah but the thing that really grated me about janelle monet is i grew up um in North Florida, about 30 minutes from Alabama. Um, And she's supposed to be from Alabama. And let me tell you is that black women from Alabama have a accent 
Oh that, yeah. And that is not that accent that she has at all. <laughs> when I was when I was hearing her talk, yeah. I was like, this is some Yankee. That's yeah. that's the first thing that comes up, you know, that came to me. I was like, this is a Yankee trying to ape some southern accent, and it's not based yeah. in reality. And it to me, yeah. it was so grating. And I was like, I can't be the only person who thinks this. So I, I looked it up and I saw black women on Twitter. Like, this about, is not like, how <laughs> this is not how we talk in Alabama. Like <laughs> this is like she got it completely wrong. And then I was yeah. people told me that's the joke. I'm like, I don't think that's the joke. I don't like I can see Daniel Craig's like overly draw, like everyone knows he's British and he's doing this like, you know, Kentucky draw. No one talks like like no one talks like Daniel Craig's character. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but like I can see how that is sort of a caricature. Yeah. or a parody of a certain type of character and um yeah yeah and 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 persona like this this southern gentleman sort of guy um but with her i think she was really trying a trying to be more of a have a realistic persona she's not really the she's not the figure to be ridiculed in this like yeah. even daniel craig's character is a figure to be ridiculed but only in a very kind of you know but he's still the good guy. It's, it's only as you know it's like a self uh, deprecating like sort of thing but with her she's like the straight woman of the film and so i i was like i don't think that it's a joke that her accent and delivery is terrible yeah yeah no you she know. just sucks she's just a bad actress is, is, yeah. is, the, is the real reason and and, 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 yeah. and this goes further to prove that it's like did Ryan Johnson and Janelle Monet not go to like Montgomery, Alabama and hang out with any of the people there and try to pick up on how they actually talked? Yeah, no, I'm like, sure it, to, to me, it's like, it, it comes off as like way more elitist. They're yeah. trying to play the, she's well, trying well, to play and the, it is. And yeah, it is. And this is the, the, the whole movie reeks of that. The whole movie reeks of like black girl magic you know it's all like oh everything she does is amazing and cool mm -hmm. like just because she's a black woman and they can't see that like no actually she's just not really a good actress but it's like that yeah. it's not they're trying to be like oh but that's just part of the magic and it's like that's actually way more racist than if they just were like being honest yeah yeah it comes off as as to, to me at least how i felt it came off as like condescending it came yeah, off as that kind of like uh, you know, coastal coastal lib condescension towards um, people in a flyover state. And it doesn't matter necessarily that they're black or they're white, but there is a condes condescension that they have. And that's really how it came off. And I mean, her character is very, very two-dimensional, but so is everybody else's. Uh, you know, you have Dave Bautista, who's supposed to be what, Joe Rogan? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so, like, uh, yeah, yeah. To me, I was like, oh, okay, he's Joe Rogan, but it's like, but he lives in his in his mom's basement. <laughs> but I'm like, if he's getting millions of dollars, uh, right, why yeah. is he living in his mom's basement? <laughs> you know, if he's like this famous guy. I think of that. That's such a good point. Yeah, and it's just another example of like these two dimensional bad guys that exist in Ryan Johnson's like two D world of Twitter, where it's like. This guy's both a billionaire, but really dumb. And this guy's yeah. like really successful, but he lives in his mom's basement because oh, and it has, they're not people. And, and wasn't, yeah. but correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't there a thing about him like not being able to get it up? There's always some penis thing. Yeah, it has to be that the Republican or the conservative guy can't, it like is impotent in some way, right? Yeah. It, it has, you have to have that. You have to have that there. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. Right. And then, um, and then there was a Democrat uh, politician and her main fault was that she wasn't actually a Democrat at heart. Exactly, right. And they had, they were like, oh, that'll make it more complicated. She's a Democrat. You know? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, the, yeah. and then they go, but what's wrong about her is that she's, she's more like Republican. Republican. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so you're, you're basically being like, right. attacking, like, she's supposed to be like, who? Cinema? mansion yeah, or, I think or something she was like Kristen cinema that was a Kristen cinema you know perfect, yeah in perfect time perfect time um <clears throat> for Kristen cinema to you know not be a democrat anymore right <laughs> which is also fake you know it, it's yeah. also like definitely not real 
Um, okay, let's not just be too uh, complaining, though. I, I'm, I'm worrying we're erring on the side of just being too, like, nothing is good and we're great and nothing is good. But uh, overall, though, final question on Glass Onion. Are we now just going to be, like, stuck? Now, these movies do well, right? So now we're going to be yeah. stuck with this. I'm already seeing from the mind of Rian, J- Ryan Johnson all over the place because it's like the, the, the Hollywood's like, oh, we got one. We, you know, yeah. we, we got finally one that people want to see that like we can control. So like, why do people want to see this stuff? And now are we just going to be stuck with this terrible crap for like years? Um, Yeah. And I think that it's only going to get worse as we go into a recession, because as we go into a recession, people have less spending power. Yeah. 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 Um, You know, uh, studios are going to err more on the side of safe than they are going to err on the side of like making something good. Right. So, it, but the thing with like glass onion is, yeah, it did really well. It did super well on Netflix. It only, it was only in some select theaters for a week. I actually saw it in the theater, um, but only like in cities like New York, Austin, LA, like bigger cities. And so you can't really gauge like how like most of America would like react you know how like how it would be if it was a bigger theatrical release i don't really know i think it being on netflix and basically it having daniel craig who still is like riding off the whole james bond fame people click on it like it's much like i you know but does that mean that they would spend money on that movie that like that's a big question but i mean netflix like after putting glass onion out last last month did gain a whole bunch of new really? subscribers hey, this month uh, yeah. yeah well and also the first one did well the first one was not netflix right yeah no the first one was not netflix the yeah. first one was released traditionally yeah and then netflix bought the rights to the ip because it did even the first one did well and i was yeah. so surprised that the first one did well because i was like this sucks why is this yeah i didn't well? like the i didn't like the first one people keep yeah. telling me that the first one was good i'm like no like it's like again it's shitty agatha christie like without really any of the suspense yeah i just don't know. get it it's like one of those things that is somehow people are responding to and i just don't like understand. there was, there was another there was another movie where you instantly knew chris evans was a bad guy yeah yeah, yeah. you know I'm right like, okay i get it <laughs> yeah um <laughs> but, okay yeah so moving on to maybe a good version of a populist eat the rich film let's talk about um triangle of sadness so what did you think i Okay, so I saw some of the comments you were making about Triangle of Sadness. I yeah. completely agree that it's like a blunt instrument. It's not, mm-hmm. It is in no way subtle at all. Um, no, it's it's not. And yeah. as far as Oslin's work goes, I think my favorite of his is still The Square. Oh, The Square is incredible. It is yeah. so good. And no one talks about it. Like, yeah, I think I, yeah. I tried to find the ape scene or no, no, the ape scene exists on like in clips. There's another mm-hmm. scene in there. And this is obviously I'm in the world of marketing. There's a scene in there where like they're trying to recreate the ice bucket challenge. Oh, yeah. Like this marketing agency gets hired to recreate like they're and they're really they're like trying to tell them how to recreate this thing to market the movie or something and it's so clear this is something that he went through himself because i've been in that exact room like a hundred times where the The client says that exact thing the square felt very much like how like it it felt very much like a lot of the stuff was based on like actual things he went through i mean i worked on commercials and you know and hearing you know you always have like when you're on when you're filming a commercial for like I worked on commercial for like Big Pharma, like Humera and stuff like that back when I was working on cruise. Yeah, I've written for Big Pharma. I've done, yeah. I've written those commercials. Yeah. And so like uh, um, you have the agency there, you have the director and you yeah. have like your typical film crew and then you have the agency and you set up the video village for them. You get the shot and every, and, and then they, and then they watch the shot like 20 times and the shot can just be like some B-roll shot. Like it's just like, oh, a guy standing on a beach. And they'll and they'll be like, oh, you know, they'll have like a whole fucking list. Oh Actually, one, one funny thing is I was so doing a, I was working on and a They're all getting paid to write their one little opinion of like, oh, can they, we, maybe it's more accurate if it's, and it's like, it's a fucking Humira commercial. Like this, this, nobody yeah. cares. Like, well, the, shut up. The, the funniest, the funniest thing is uh, um, I was working on a commercial. It was a 
it was a commercial for uh, both the WWE and Five Hour Energy. Um, and it was with the Uso twins who were from my hometown. They're the Rock's cousins. And they were like, you know, doing all this like Five Hour Energy, uh, you know, chilling Five Hour Energy through the WWE or something like that. The director of photography of that, uh, really cool guy, Andre Secula. He was actually cinematographer for American Psycho and Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs. Like he has a pretty, pretty good, you know, uh, catalog of uh, films, but commercials pay better than movies. So a lot of these cinematographers do commercials for work, you know? Oh, I mean, they all the, even the biggest, even Harmony Korine has been, does like tons of commercials. Todd yeah. Field does. I mean, they all yeah. do commercials. Yeah. So anyways, for one of like the product shot, right. It's like supposed to be in the, uh, um, locker room where they're training you know in the stadium and it's literally just like the camera slides a little bit on a small dolly reveals the five hour five hour energy you know we have a soft key light on it you know we have a, like just a little bit of a light here it's a pretty simple setup but it's like what are you going to do it's sitting inside a locker right and so the agency's there and they're like what if we move this light slightly? And what if we, do you think that we can get another light in there? And Andre Sekula was just like, and is like, he's like this uh, grumpy Polish guy. I, he's like one of the most amazing people I've ever met in this industry. He's like, we are not painting Sistine Chapel. We are making five hour energy commercials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shut the fuck up, agent. Agency people are the absolute worst. Mm -hmm. And it, and none of them have anything to say. They're all just there to justify their massive paycheck. So they're like, yeah. I need to say something. Let me I need I need to have some opinion. That's why I'm here. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, yeah. Um but yeah, so with the square like the square definitely for, for me that felt the most real. The tri triangle of sadness to me. Uh, was a little bit too blunt. It was very um, blunt. It was it, it was, was not it was not subtle at all. But the thing that I did like about it, so I, I liked the film. I didn't quite love it. Like it was too blunt for me to love it. Um, the uh, but what I liked is that it does go beyond um, like what Glass Onion and the Menu are doing. The Glass Onion and Menu are taking these extremely super. The Glass Onion is the most superficial. The menu is, has a little bit more depth than Glass Onion does. Um, but they're taking this very superficial um, approaches to satirizing uh, the bourgeois. But what what Oslin does in, in Triangle of Sadness that I thought was more interesting was how the um, he's satirizing the bourgeois, and that is a m big part of it. Uh, but, you know, there's three different sections of the movie. There's the section pre ship uh, with the fashion, you know, the fashion show and the stuff that uh, is after the fashion show, there's this stuff on the ship and then there's this stuff on the beach. Yeah. Um, also another issue I had was I think I thought that the beach stuff dragged a, a, like a bit too much. And I yeah. think that some of that could have been cut because I got the idea pretty quickly and then it yeah, they didn't sort of really, right. Itself. It was like that, that didn't evolve anywhere super interesting. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, like the, it would have been good stuff. if it would have been good if that had evolved like one more step, you know, like, yeah, like and if done it had, sooner. she had been if the woman. So it, it ends in this like it's a bunch of rich people. First of all, I want to actually say something about the word, word bourgeois. Like it's actually tough to say whether this is the bourgeois or this is the, the elite, right? Because there's yeah. actually a difference between the bourgeois and the elite. Yeah, We're kind of yeah. using that interchangeably here, which is fine. Most people do that. It's it's okay. But uh, what happens is it's a ultra elite luxury. Group. It, it, this isn't this isn't is, just like a really nice room. This is like an ultra elite like group. Yeah, it's this like is the buried. ultra elite. Like it's yeah, yeah. it's the Lord of War. Um, yeah. It's the Russian right. oligarch. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is like this is like yeah. not a, a really nice princess cruise. This is like a hundred thousand dollar cruise, if not more. You know. If, yeah, you know, exactly. Like you yeah. have to have a shit ton of money. Yeah. I would say that the main character, the two main characters, are they're bourgeois, but they're bourgeois, but not elite, and that's why 
Well, but they're but, invited into that world because of her fame, though, right? Because they're there yeah. for free. They're not paying. Yeah, her. because she's an Instagram. Model. Yeah, yeah, because she's an Instagram. Model. So you're right. Yeah, they exactly. couldn't afford this, but they're like used to getting stuff for free because they're these yeah, ex- people. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. it's yeah, exactly it's a uh, uh, it's pretty privilege. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> but so what I do well. like, but the what the film does that allows it to get deeper is that it it examines hierarchies in different settings with the same sort of cast of characters so first you know we start off with the man and the the girl and um how he gets kicked like he sits down but then somebody comes and they have to move everyone over and you know even though that was his seat like he gets kicked out and she makes him pay for everything uh yet she's the one making money yeah you know or yet she's she's like the famous one and 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 he's like her pay pig in a sense yeah. you know but he's like so lower than her and she's getting by on her pretty privilege and she has all the power over him and he essentially has to like grasp onto her you know like remora and uh and and uh yeah and so there's that hierarchy I then think we she's go into, dead by the way did you know that she, yeah she, yeah she, she died dead, the right after the film premiered at Cannes film festival which is crazy Sad. yeah and uh supposedly from some she had like a kidney or liver transplant when she was a kid oh it was, really okay. yeah it was, it was some sort of yeah that ended up failing you know yeah that's, it's kind of weird to be like using even for this it's like using a poster of her in a bathing suit and she's dead it's yeah like a weird feeling but yeah so so then in the ship um you know you have the 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 kind of the stand what i would say is like the standard sort of the elites and the servants but even and then there's the people below the servants you know there's like there's the servants who dress nicely and are you know the face of the ship and then there's like the mexicans uh basically who Who are actually filipinos in this case but yeah they're or filipinos yeah yeah (laughs) Um, same thing yeah (laughs) pirate mexicans in la it really is the same (laughs) it's like the indistinguishable because they yeah. have the same name so because you well, yeah, know they're, they're spanish right yeah because yeah because yeah, they're spanish yeah. yeah um spanish polynesian right um but yeah so it's like you have the filipinos uh who are basically you know the cleaning the bathrooms and and doing all the sort of the dirty work and you know basically they're like they're the ones that are uh making the ship run the uh the servants are the are like their face you know it's like the pretty face so that yeah the elites feel like they're you know on like it's only like pretty people it's only like the you know higher class people but really the servants are kind of more in that well a few of the servants are like managerial yeah well or and it's like pretty faced white people from you know um like nordic countries yeah from nordic countries which is actually so, what i re- there was a couple of scenes in it on the boat that just felt having been on both sides of this so i've i've been in the service industry and i've been in you know uh not the alt i i have seen the ultra elite environments i've been in them before and so there's a couple scenes. There's one in which like the waiter people who are again, sort of the face of the ship as opposed mm-hmm. to the Filipinos who are like the people actually scrubbing away. And there's a scene where they're all getting ready. And it's like, mm-hmm. she's saying, yeah, let's get money. And it's yeah. pretty like obvious, but they're like hyping themselves up to like be servants. And mm-hmm. there was something, even though it was very obvious, it was just so like true to life and it was so mm-hmm. real and then there's another uh, scene where this like pretty, I guess she's like from New Zealand or something, kind of white girl who's a servant is uh, tending to the rich Russian oligarchs, which are thinly veiled Jews. They're, they're trying not mm-hmm. to say they're Jews, but they very obviously are. And so it's like these Russian Jewish couple. And it's like the woman wants to bond with this servant of hers who is this like pretty faced white girl Mm -hmm. and she's kind of trying to like 
switch places with her because she has this like inner guilt and the scene is just yeah. so well written and it's like i have seen that exact thing happen before like like the, yeah I've, I've seen like people treat servants in that exact way like they think they're trying to be like on their level but in fact it's condescending it's ultra condescending yeah and, and that's what i think overall Remember in the beginning of the film, there's a fashion show that's like a woke fashion show. And in the yeah. background, it says, I forget exactly what it says, but it says something like cynicism masquerading as optimism or something. Yeah. You know, like there's some great, like very obvious line, but it's like what he nails is that this particular elite, it's same with the ice bucket challenge. It's same with the scene in the square where the people are like wanting to get beaten up. There's something about this particular elite that hates itself yeah. and that wants to yeah. like pretend that it's not elite. And that there, there's something about that that's so much more disgusting and gross than, a, than an elite that just liked being an elite. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's a, it is a self-hatred that stems from narcissism. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because it's because they have this they've adopted this whole idea that the elites are bad and they have to delude themselves that they aren't the elite but yeah. then still have all their creature comforts right. all there yeah you know and really what that does is it becomes like this just gross play of them larping as working class people and working class people or anyone who's not elite sees it and they're just like what the hell are you doing just like it was better when you were just this snobby and, and, yeah <laughs> right, right at least you knew your place yeah you know, at exactly. least you knew your role whereas it's like don't try and like right just tell me to go get you something you know don't live live with your guilt like this is what's great about british upstairs downstairs dramas like i think the reason why we love them is because like there's tension but they're comfortable in their roles mm -hmm. They're like the servant wants doesn't necessarily want to be a servant, but the servant knows they're a servant, and the aristocrat knows they're aristocrat. The servant's not constantly, you know, the the queen is not constantly trying to like bond with the, you know, yeah. like there's there's a separation there, and that that's that's more dignified. Yeah, exactly. And um, you know, I've worked in the service industry for years uh, as well, and whenever a person would try to I don't want to like even try to like be cool with me or something yeah. like that. I would just be thinking like, like, I, I'm not going to see you again. Like yeah. just ask, like the best thing you can do for me is just have me do my job. Like, uh, and it's, it's always people who are maybe a little bit wealthier that, that try to try to do that. And yeah. like, don't like, but then, but then they do. But the thing is, is that they try to be like nice to, they try to like be, get, be like buddy, buddy, but they're also like the ones that, also try to like um push you yeah and, and and it's like look this isn't my job like no no, no you can make it happen i'm like no i no i can't <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> i literally can't and then they you know i'm just like stop doing this and i was you know <laughs> thinking uh, the, the one scene in the movie that, that stands out uh, as that is um when the french lady wants her to get into the tub because the service workers are told you know, it's like this whole idea that we have in Western American society, especially of like the customer is always right. Yeah. And they're like, you never say no. Yeah, so right. That's like, the scene I'm talking about. That's the scene. Yeah. Like, that's get, get, yeah get into the hot tub. And yeah. it's like, uh, you know, but it's like she doesn't know because it's like, no, she has to work, but she also can't say no. And then the fact that they demand that all everybody on the ship uh, go like, swims with them because yeah <laughs> because they feel guilty that they're the ones right enjoying themselves yeah, yeah and but the fact that but because because of that it causes the um all like the food to go bad yeah. <laughs> you know and and it causes like the whole chain of events that you know yeah um spirals out of control and <laughs> and so <laughs> And uh, but yeah, it's it's out of this sort of guilt, and it's that guilt, and it is that being unsure of where they fit that leads to all this all this chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, but you know, talking about how this the hierarchies work, you know, so it's the elites, so it's like three different social structure or three different social strata on the ship, 
And then we get <clears throat> the two social or maybe three different different kinds of social strata on the beach, which then it's the in, inverse. So like in a natural environment, the people who work, the people who work with their hands, who know what they're doing are the ones at the top. And um, I'm glad that they had her corrupted very, very quickly too, because that's realistic that like, you know, she becomes like a tribe chieftain type and then takes, and then all of a sudden the person who is pretty privileged is the boy and not the girl, like yeah, in the beginning. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then he's sleeping with her basically to get, you know, all, all the free stuff, you know, and to live <laughs> the life, like the life of luxury. And then the, and then there's the elites that, you know, they are, they manage people, they work behind the scenes, but they don't do stuff with their hands, like all the kind of stuff needed for survival. They just hire people to do, they have enough money to where they haven't had to ever think about that. Uh, so they don't really know what to do. They are taking her orders. And then there's, um, you know, the kind of the defective sort of pe people who, you know, who are just uh, like the one lady who was paralyzed. The freeloading. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the freeloaders and yeah you know and so there's uh so it does it flips it on its on its head where the the bottom are at the top the top are at the bottom but it also shows that when the bottom goes to the top they they're corrupted yeah they're they're, they're no better in fact she's worse yeah. than the elites when they were at the top right um so the so what i was talking about with the movie is that Woody, like, we haven't even talked about Woody Harrelson, of course, when Which we're, ha when right. he's having the dinner, the reason why yeah. he, he uh, doesn't get sick like everybody else is because he has the cheeseburger, you know, and he's like, no, nah, I don't like fancy food. But again, he, he, like, he owns that boat. He isn't elite, but he is bourgeois because he owns the boat. He is kind of the head of the managerial class. You know, he's like their, their head honcho guy. He definitely could eat all the fancy food that he wants anytime um but it, it it does kind of stem from also him being not liking or being guilty about his role of eating with the elite or perhaps his disdain for the people in that social strata that are right right above his um and he wants to make a point that he's not one of them or something you know but then he gets drunk with the uh Russian oligarch and um you know and he's reading off all the the you know the Marxist uh Lenin yeah, they're quotes. trading Marxist versus capitalist barbs yeah yeah and like I kind of get the the comedy of that but you so know that with that how Woody Harrelson like Woody Harrelson is set up to be like make like probably the the most likable character he's like oh, these elites they're like I, you know, I have to like do this stuff for them. And, and he's like the character that like every person who's been in a service worker is like, Oh yeah. Like, oh, man, like I have to put on a show for these guys. Like, no, I don't want to do that. Like, um, and I think that he's meant to be ideologically maybe more aligned with Osland. So I did kind of like the whole, like reading capitalist versus Marxist quotes again, that goes in the whole bluntness of the film. Um, and I was like, you know, the, the, the sequence of, you know, the, the storm and everything was fun with everyone throwing up. And, yeah. and that is a case. I will say this. That is a case where the movie became the cheeseburger, <laughs> you know, like the menu, the menu yeah. didn't go to where Triangle of Sadness went, even though, you know, so Triangle of Sadness did become the cheeseburger. Yeah, it, it it gave us it gave us a certain amount of cheeseburger for sure. I yeah. was I was fully cheeseburgered by it. so la last question, then we should wrap up here. Um, and I think this is the perfect punctuation point to end with the cheeseburger. But uh where did you think it went wrong? Like, yeah, like because it, it's definitely very heavy-handed. It's definitely like the metaphors are just so blatantly drawn. And yeah, it, it, it's a little self-indulgent and like the puking goes on for so long. Yeah. <laughs> it's puking and then shit, I honestly, and shit like, flying everywhere. And the whole, so where did it go wrong? Yeah. The whole puking going like and all that even going on uh, for long, like I was kind of, I was kind of all for that, you know, yeah, I was like, okay. oh, oh, good. Um, Where it went wrong for me is I just feel like it's, 
um, it could have been a lot tighter. And I feel like uh, the third part on the beach, I don't know if it was the longest, it felt the longest and it also felt the most underdeveloped. So I liked the whole reveal at the end that they were actually at a resort the whole time and just had no idea. And it's like, yeah. oh, they're all just idiots. Like they, they didn't even go and try to explore, or do anything. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's like it needed to hit some of those plot points um faster because what we ended up having having was a lot of repetition in the film, a lot of kind of treading over old ground. And um, like I really liked the opening. I liked a lot of the parts on the boat. It really was like once it got to once it got to the beach, it lost a lot of its steam for me. And yeah. that's why I say I, I I liked it. I still liked it. I just didn't love it. It just the the last act just sort of um lost its momentum, I felt like. Yeah, I know. I think you're totally I, I don't disagree that it it definitely um it's not even close to a perfect film. It's a very flawed, seamy. It, it, you really see the seams. You know, it's like a kind of like, um, yeah, it's it's not very well composed. I will say amazing use of Fred again in the last scene. I don't, I don't know if you're a music fan, but uh, they're, like Fred again is like the coolest possible music you could use. And I was when I heard it, I was like, mm. oh, my God, he like, how the hell did he put this in the movie? Like, I just heard that song. Like, how, how did yeah, I don't know. If, I don't that? know if I know that I, I recognize the song, but I didn't. Oh, no. dude, that, yeah. that song's like, you know, I was in Miami for Urbit and everybody was listening. That Like, that was the song, like, everybody. That's probably where I heard it then, song. Before, <laughs> I saw the, before I saw the film. Yeah, you were right. Um, so, no, I, I agree with you that it's like, especially from like a filmmaking perspective. But for me, like, I just, I forgave that because I thought that the the pastiche and the commentary, which was, you know, these movies are, as you said, it's, when they are making themselves obvious that it is politics first, mm -hmm. like, I'm like, okay, you know, you don't need to pay off the plot as much for me. Like, I don't really, you know, it's. Well, it's I, I would, I would say that like, um, I think maybe I was a little harsher on Triangle of Sadness too, because I saw it before I saw the menu and glass onion. I think oh, that if okay. I saw the menu and glass onion first, I'd be a lot more lenient on, on Triangle of Sadness. Uh, and you know, we're talking about how Triangle of Sadness is about the elite basically wanting to act like they're, you know, they're like a, a common, the common man, like that is encapsulated in the menu and Glass Onion in that the filmmakers and the people are trying to sort of portray themselves. It's like, oh yeah, we're the anti-elites. Yeah. It's like, no, you are the elites. Right. right. You know, it's right. like you just have guilt about being elites and that's why you're making these movies. At least that's how it feels to me. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think? Last thing, what, what do you think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of trend? Cause it is sure weird that the cheese, the cheeseburger thing is so genius. You pointed that out. Like, crazy that that occurred in the same you know two movies in the same year are we gonna see like more of this or where where does this you know, signal anything or i i think that well <laughs> you know if it, if it makes some money and the menu i think is like one of the most watched movies on hbo max ever. oh is that true oh so it did mm -hmm. really well okay. yeah so the menu did okay in the theaters when it went to hbo max it blew up and like now everyone has seen the menu it's yeah now it's certifiably probably one of the biggest movies of last year uh glass onion obviously did gangbusters on on netflix triangle sadness like it did okay for a can movie like for a european film that's for a niche audience uh but i don't think its budget was was that high anyways i think it might be oslin's one of his more popular films I think, okay you know i would say it definitely has more of a popular appeal than force majeure or the square oh but force majeure was like hilarious though i mean i feel yeah. like that's just like a solid comedy right yeah but i i would have to look at the at the numbers of um okay i'm gonna look this up the numbers of triangle of sadness i mean it won the palm door like it's obviously critically acclaimed or well actually i mean it was critically acclaimed now i think it's evened out to being a little bit mixed in the favor of it being good uh, I think that a lot of people are like, yeah, the you know, same like what we're saying is that it's a good movie, but a very flawed yeah, um, yeah. film nonetheless. Actually, the film from Cannes that I loved um, was uh, 
um, Broker, the new film by Hirokazu Kurita. Oh. Um, that one was great. Uh, broker. Is broker. That, can I watch that? I think, well, it's in theaters right now. Broker. Um, so Triangle of Sadness made $10 million, and I I don't, I think its budget was way less than that. Um, but, you know, we also had Tar that was going after the whole cancel culture of within yeah. the elite, within the whole, that, you know, that whole sort of woke culture as well. Um, so I think that as long as these movies do well financially, uh, that they're going to be made. Yeah. You know, this kind of, and I think that this trend, like we, we start to see, at least in America, this trend. And we're going to, I think that because of the success, Squid Game, you know, Squid Game's there too. Um, and Squid Game was like one of the biggest shows on, on Netflix. And Maybe it's crazy because it was ever. South Korea, yeah. South Korean show. And um, yeah, I think we're going to see more of this moving forward especially too as populist sentiments rise like uh honestly probably the best thing for populism on both the left and the right um is is the fact that joe biden is is president you know <laughs> and just people like seeing going back to the years of bush and obama you know and seeing like oh yeah I remember like like the old guard sucks you know yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. like old guys suck <laughs> Yeah, they really do suck. Mm -hmm. um, well, I definitely want to talk to you for sure about both uh, Tar and Babylon, but I don't think we have time today. Um, yeah, have time. yeah, no, I agreed with you about Babylon in your article. Yeah. How it's like Damien Chazelle going like, well, yeah, the, the elite are like crude and degenerate and everything, but it's it's cool, guys. It's, it's good. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. I swear. And yeah, it's like clear that he has had been having a great time for the past few years and is feeling very inspired. And he's like, this can't be bad, right? Like, it's okay that I'm doing all this crazy shit. You know, yeah. it, it's like, all right, whatever. And, right. Yeah. It, it, well, the movie came off as so like, uh edge lordy from a person who's never been edgy right he's like it's life. mountains of cocaine <laughs> like, it's yeah like, all right man it's, it's like, like he went to down, like two dude. parties that had cocaine at them he was like oh this is what yeah it's like uh, maybe watch ken park and then get back yeah there. right right he's like i did cocaine guys it's it's fun so fun <laughs> yeah yeah that's how i yeah. felt or it. or the whole like I, I love Tobin Maguire's character, but the whole thing at, at the like the bottom of like the deepest pit of hell, the, the worst thing he can come up with is this guy bites heads off of rats. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I've seen Cam I saw worse than Cannibal Holocaust. Uh, yeah. And that was made 40 years ago. So I have seen Cannibal Holocaust. And yeah. I love Cannibal Holocaust. So I love it too. Movie. Oh, the soundtrack is so good. Oh yeah. Um, it's a great movie. Yeah. And yeah, yeah it, I'm just like, dude, you, you bring, you know, in Babylon, you bring me down to the depths of LA hell and it's some dude eating rats. Yeah, it's, it's, that's all you got. <laughs> that's all you got, Damien. Come on. Yeah. I'm like, you, okay. <laughs> all, all right. You sheltered kid who moved to, who, yeah. you know, got into Hollywood and yeah, did cocaine once or He's twice. Just all right. one, they want him to work out so bad. I, and you know, we'll see, but anyway, all right. Um, thank you so much, man. This was really great. I really, oh, really yeah. enjoyed this. This actually, I was in a terrible mood and this put me in a very good mood. So thank you for uh, coming on. Oh yeah, no, it was my pleasure. Cool. All right. See you later. Wait, oh, no, right. no, no, sorry. You have something to, uh, you have something Oh to yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to show for anyone who has made it to the end of this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, if you work in tech, if you have an open source project, uh, if you, uh, my company is giving, uh, grants uh, several grants each month uh micro grants so like up to three thousand dollars a piece um micro grants to different uh open source you know open source uh projects and we're gonna be doing like i don't know six to eight each month something like that as well as like uh signal boosting uh these projects on all of our socials and on our website and everything like that so uh if you go to fudo.org and look in the grants section you can figure out how to apply to uh, one of our micro grants. So is but this yeah, we're giving company, out free money. the company you work for? Yeah, I work for food. I'm wearing the oh, okay. hat right now. Yeah, so I work for them. But yeah, um, we're giving out free money. So, you know, 
if you have a project to open, you know, I know that it's probably some, oh, I just knocked my mic. Probably some people here are you know, <laughs> working tech. Do you have like a, it, it, the, the only thing is it has to be open source. That's like our, our main thing. Oh, but this is interesting. Independent software lab grand. Oh, okay. This is awesome. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> wow. This seems kind of in the urban e space. Well, yeah, we were, um, I mean, on our, uh, for our YouTube channel, I, I did a, uh, interview with, uh, Curtis Yarvin, like eight months ago or so. Oh, cool. Cool. Awesome. Um, all right, man. Well, thank you so much. I'll put Fudo in the, in the stuff and, um, oh, the cool. notes. All right. All right.